I'm Joshua Gay. A um, little about me. Uh, I have been working in the free software movement for about 15 years now. Um, or I guess 18 years now. Uh, I started out uh, really as an activist, wanting to spread the message about what free software was and why it was important. Um, I worked as a volunteer with the Gadoo Project and the Free Software Foundation for a number of years before becoming their first campaigns manager and doing sort of uh, public awareness activism campaigns. I moved on to becoming their licensing and compliance manager for seven years. And I worked with a number, uh, over the last decade or so, I've worked with a number of open educational resource projects as well. Uh, I now am working with the IEEE Standards Association. Um, my role is to help them bring uh, open source to the IEEE. Um, traditionally, IEEE has not been involved in software development, uh, let alone open source software development. Uh, we're a large organization. As since everybody here seems to be pretty familiar with them. Um, you probably know us. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a bit of an undertaking. <laughs> um, so I'll just leave that to you all, sort of the backstory of my background. And um, I can say that, you know, they were definitely looking for somebody with 10 to 15 years experience. So um, uh, it was a good fit. I, needed a job and they needed somebody who's been doing this for a long time. Uh, oops, sorry. I, uh, I also kind of gutted my slide deck after careful review of what I should be saying and shouldn't be saying. I'm new to the IEEE, so <laughs> uh, understanding some things. Um, this is supposed to say about the IEEE. Um, uh, we're pretty big, 420,000 members. Uh, that's kind of ballpark. It's about, you know, 350,000 or so um, that are members to societies. Um, uh, the others are members in different capacities, whether that's uh, voting members and standards or in uh, some of our other ways in which you can uh, become affiliated uh, and be a paid member. Uh, we're in 160 countries. Um, our revenue sources primarily come from the fact that we host um, over 1,800 annual conferences a year. And uh, we publish a lot of um, documents. Uh, most of them, I would say, are paywalled. So those are also revenue sources. Um, sort of that, that general setup of being primarily an organization that publishes, uh, you know, in terms of the products we create of, of paywall documents. You know, that, that isn't necessarily the setup that says, here's this open source <laughs> organization. Um, and, and I don't mean that in any sort of judgmental way. That's just how it is. Um, so the Standards Association itself. Uh, we have over 1,100 active standards. That means within the last 10 years, those standards have been renewed and are considered active. Um, uh, this year, we have currently, I think, I think this number is right, 600 standards under development. Uh, I picked some standards. These, these aren't necessarily our, uh, our biggest or most famous standards. Uh, we're known primarily uh, from power, uh, industry, and, 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 you know, things like that. But uh, for, for this audience, I figured, you know, you might be familiar with 802.11, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. Uh, some of you might have had to deal with the floating point standard. <laughs> <laughs> I know I have. That, that, that gets kind of nitty-gritty. You got your IEEE flag and your, you know, pound defined statements. Um, VHDL, uh, JTAG. Um, 
some of the things I left off here, which are a little bit interesting, you know, we have standards these days that are on, under active development that are uh, related to, say, quality in journalism, sort of figuring out what is fake news and what isn't. Uh, standards around ethics and um, other sort of uh, higher level standards that have to do with whether it's uh, engineering or communications. So it's a pretty broad range from power to modern sort of communications, telecommunications, I would say. In addition to our standards development within the Standards Association, uh, we also have a program called Industry Connections. So uh, people can come to us and they're not sure what they want to do. They know they have some problem to solve and they have a lot of, say, uh, different uh, companies and, and individuals or some subfield where they want to start thinking about um, solutions. And you know that might be to create a standard or it might be guidelines or it might be to conduct a study to figure out what should be done. So we call that our industry connections program. Um, we also have a conformity assessment program. So you know, here's a, some standard and now people are out there making products. We go ahead and say, uh, here's a certification uh, program, a conformity assessment program. Is your product conforming with this uh, standard? So those are sort of our, I would say, three big um, outward facing uh, programs that we have within the Standards Association. Uh, one thing I left off here is that the uh, uh, IEEE ISTO is um, they contract to the Standards Association to do uh, their alliance management as well. So you might have heard of Open Power Foundation, MIPI Alliance, Wireless Power. Um, those are all IEEE ISTO uh, alliances. Um, and so I personally uh, am one of the people at the Standards Association that can be contracted to work for the IEEE ISTO. It's a separate entity. It's a 501c6 um, uh, business association uh, are usually under 501c6s. The IEEE itself is a charitable nonprofit, a 501c3. Um, any questions about sort of this? You know, high level uh, things about who we are. Uh, on the conformity assessment, uh, is that similar to underwriters labs uh, coming out and take uh, inspecting a manufacturing process? So that is a form of conformity assessment. At this time, um, we're not doing any assessments like that. Our conformity assessment program is somewhat new. And I'm fairly certain that right now, the only kind we're doing are uh, products. So, you know, this is some, uh, you know, transformer or something that goes into a, uh, you know, uh, something power or communications related uh, product, usually industry grade, something that's going to go into infrastructure. Uh, we contract out to uh, testing labs that are, you know, certified for doing this kind of assessment. Um, and uh, we put together sort of the, you know, the criteria that they'll test against. So you do the test that says, does this product do what it says? It's, does it meet the specification? This standard, right. So Underwriters Lab only does the test that says, will it not kill somebody? And they don't care whether it does. I see. Yeah, I don't know. We focus on whether it conforms to the what we say it should conform to. So that's mostly saying conforming to the standard or a part of the standard, right? Um, uh, but there are uh, some other things that it, uh, sometimes we say it should do as well to be the spirit of that. Um, uh, you know, something configured a very certain way would meet it. Is that the default configuration? You know, is that how you're actually using this and in, in USB practice. standards are a good example. Right, exactly. Um, uh, that sort of general principle, you got it. You have to go a little bit more beyond just the standard itself sometimes. And, um, you know, we're, this is a small growing department. I'm excited to start collaborating with them because there's definitely opportunities there um, from a free software perspective. Any other questions on sort of who the IEEE is? Uh, welcome, thank you for coming. 
Um, are, are you familiar with the IEEE by any chance? A little bit. A little bit? More with the internet governance. Okay. I can jump back a slide, you know, just give you a perspective how our size, 420,000 members, 160 countries, 45 technical societies and councils, um, a lot of conferences, a lot of technical documentation, and um, different departments. One of our departments, the one I'm in, is Standards Association. Figure there's not too many people here. I can just run back through and get everybody caught up. If that's all right. Welcome. Um, so just to sort of give you a sense, uh, we have a, a lot of political layers in the IEEE. Uh, normally, that's something that uh, I would be really weary about. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it certainly doesn't make things quick. We're a slow-moving org. Um, we have a board of governors in the Standards Association that reports to the board of directors of the IEEE. The board of governors are members. Um, they're voted. They're volunteers. Below them, there's many committees, also members, volunteers, um, that are voted into uh, these positions. Uh, after in 2015, uh, one of those groups, the uh, corporate advisory groups, uh, noticed from the various corporate members of the Standards Association that there was a lot of interest in open source. So they began some exploratory work in 2015, forming um, at an ad hoc, uh, some sort of a subcommittee that included members as well as other people, whether it was staff or outside. Uh, people outside of the corporate advisory group or the board of governors to explore uh, open source. Um, uh, two years later, <laughs> two full years later, um, we've gotten to the point where the board of governors uh, has uh, passed a resolution saying that the standards uh, association board has to go ahead and uh, provide oversight. So begin the process of, of uh, providing formal rules. Uh, so that's this year. It's not clear if, uh, if uh, 2018 uh, will bring us these resolutions we want or if that'll go into 2019, right? So that's- Is it a priority? Is there any sort of- Oh, this is, yeah, this is a big deal. Right, is there, is there uh, I, I'm just trying to, and, and, and this isn't necessarily super slow for us, uh, but yeah, 2015 was sort of starting exploratory work, forming groups. 2016, they pushed a little harder. 2017, they hired me in the summer um, and sort of had four active uh, working groups, one to explore intellectual property rights, one to explore... Um, uh, marketing of open source, uh, one to explore general process, sort of just the general open source process, and um, one for pilots. Um, and our ad hocs and work streams are sort of a formal way in which we can allocate uh, time and resources of various people, staff and others. So the uh, pilots wasn't necessarily a working group so much as it was, you know, a couple of people, uh, myself included, um, uh, starting to bring in pilot work groups. Um, is, that's the work that also began in 2017. And then at the end of it, uh, this is the resolution of the Board of Governors. Uh, one thing that, you know, so this is kind of a big deal um, right here where it says normative piece of a standard that they plan to provide oversight and activities related to it for these use cases, uh, meaning rule changes that are appropriate to permit open source and normative pieces of a standard. Um, you would actually state it in the standard. That so this would be, yeah, the standard, mm -hmm. right? So you can literally have an entire standard, which is an open source project. There's nothing that if they're not going to say only some of it can be open source, right? So for, for an organization that uh, does not publish 
their standards as open source. That does paywall them, right? This idea that we would have a rule change that is going to permit uh, working groups to make that choice is actually pretty big, right? So it's, the timeline seems a little slow. It's being carefully thought through. But for an organization that's 130 years old and making a dramatic change for what a standard could be, it doesn't mean they'll all, <laughs> not everybody's going to flock to this. It doesn't mean we're suddenly going to have open source standards uh, everywhere. Uh, you know, the likely use case is part of a standard is going to have code in it, and it's going to be open sourced, that code. But, um, you know, there's some bigger projects which are going to be better defined. Uh, uh, the normative parts, the, more or less the entire standard as open source uh, software uh, or, you know, a, a language reference manual or any number of things. So it's, it's a, I know that that timeline seems pretty slow, but um, I hope that putting it in that perspective uh, for, for what kind of uh, org we are, the kind of standards we've previously produced, why so much thought is going into it and care. Uh, what's kind of exciting is that uh, the, the Board of Governors also have gone ahead and confirmed an intent um, that uh, essentially that non-IEEE open source projects, um, projects outside of the Standards Association, meaning all of the IEEE, or projects that are outside of the IEEE that are going to come in and want to use us as a host um, are going to be considered as well. So uh, that's also this, this, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to put sort of summary of the Board of Governors language. I don't want to put any words in their mouth. So I, my slide has exactly what they published. It's, and I, I'm here to help kind of decrypt that for you all, <laughs> um, make sense of it. So, so essentially, you know, here, the standards board is going to go ahead and, uh, and provide rules to allow for standards to have open source or be open sourced. Um, and uh, the second part says uh, the, the standards, uh, the corporate advisory board is going to go ahead and put together a set of recommendations for uh, our little open source group to go ahead and provide services to all of IEEE at large uh, for hosting or any number of other types of services. What, what's that scope? What does sort of our platform look like? So that's what this uh, nitty gritty politics look like. And I hope I gave a little bit of perspectives on what the political situation is like at the IEEE while explaining it, um, while also not necessarily offending any of my bosses or anybody else who are going to watch this recorded talk. How'd I do, Adam? So is this being recorded right now? Uh, the goal of 2018, uh, just sort of to let you know where we are, uh, is primarily to educate internally and to have internally focused talks. So some of my sensitivity and giving an externally focused talk are hopefully understood as well, um, where it's understood my activities are more or less supposed to be internally focused. But we all thought it was a good idea to go ahead and reach out and start uh, practicing, uh, reaching out to you all and, 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 and putting the word out there a bit more. Right now, uh, we're accepting pilots. Pilots uh, can be either standards projects or uh, projects within the IEEE, uh, some other part. Um, we call it pilots because we don't have all of these rule changes and we don't have sort of an official process yet. And they're really there to help us learn how to do that, um, do the work we want to be able to do in the future. Um, you know, I think it's just as important for them to know that they're a pilot project uh, more so than sort of any sort of label, um, so that uh, everybody's expectations are reasonable. We're using GitLab.com for hosting. Um, my hope is to self-host GitLab, and so I'm sort of in the process of, of uh, trying to make that happen, uh, as well as Mattermost and other services and microservices that could be of use. Uh, but uh, right now, it's just GitLab.com, and why we chose that is because um, a lot of our projects are coming to us a little bit uh, older and rough around the edges and not open source, and so having the ability to have unlimited uh, private repositories at no cost is really nice, and uh, GitHub doesn't uh, allow this, um, and there are not a lot of other third-party solutions that I could just 
immediately start using that uh, have that flexibility of unlimited uh, private repos and projects. So uh, that's the choice we've gone with. And you can see um, our pilots that are actually published in public um, under gitlab.com slash IEEE-SA. That's the group, and you'll get links to other subgroups. Um, right now, uh, pilots, if they're coming out of standards association, could choose the Apache 2.0 license or the BSD3 clause license. Oh, I'm sorry, what's the CLA? Oh, sorry. Uh, license contributor license agreements are required. So, you know, uh, it's, that's a contract between us and the contributor that says that they sign and date and say that, um, you know, they actually have the, all the rights, um, everything that the license says, they actually, uh, you know, verify that they, uh, they do have the rights to uh, grant those uh, to, to, to contribution under that license, that it's their work and not somebody else's work. Um, that's all it is. It doesn't uh, in any way um, change the sort of broaden or narrow. Um, and in fact, we have, have a kind of a wonky setup where it's literally uh, mapped to the license. So we have a CLA for the BSD3 clause and we have a CLA for the Apache 2.0 2 license, which isn't uh, standard. Normally you accept all the rights that, you, that would permit you to relicense it under anything. Um, uh, this decision was made before I came in, um, so I don't necessarily know the exact rationale behind it, but um, if, if a project's going to be licensed to Apache 2.0, the CLA pretty much maps the terms of it onto the Apache 2.0, and same with the BSD3 clause. Does the CLA also then transfer copyright? No, there's no assignment of copyright. It's just more or less the exact terms of the license. Uh, if you're familiar with the Apache Foundation CLA, uh, that's the language we've based it on. We adapted it slightly, uh, I think, for internationalization purposes of some of the clauses, but it, you're, you're not going to notice a difference. Um, and uh, for the Apache, um, when people sign that, and for the BSD, we more or less just remove the patent clause, um, since the BSD doesn't have explicit patent licensing. Um, if you're familiar with the Apache license, it has a, uh, it, it grants the use of a patent, but then it takes away the right if you, um, if you sue on, on a patent, if you, you know, so it, it has this uh, condition that uh, you have to follow. And so it, that, that's not the same as what BSD says, if, if, which uh, could be argued to just grant a blanket permission without a condition. So we, um, we didn't impose the condition on projects that are using uh, BSD3 clause. Might be a little bit more detail than you all care. Sorry, BSD? Yeah, the, that's their acronym? Yeah, BSD, yeah. like the Berkeley. System distribution. Right, like the old Unix system. Well, sorry, it's still a new Unix system to many. Um, <laughs> still new, new BSDs work. Um, outside of standards, uh, we had an uh, interest early on from an uh, open hardware project, and our legal department approved the CERN open hardware license. One thing to just point out there is that, that that's a strong copyleft license. So when you see these simple permissive licenses for standards projects, um, the, the CERN is a, is a strong copyleft license um, for all of you who care and know about licenses, the politics of it. So there's, you know, the idea of eventually having uh, GPL and other kinds of licensing offerings, you know, that, that that sort of says, well, we're not opposed to it in principle, right? Since the CERN and GPL are very similar um, in many ways um, in terms of their conditions. Uh, but that is, again, not for any of the projects within Standards Association itself. Um, and that situation is just more complicated in terms of rules and sort of the political and legal aspects for. So some of it, somewhere in a previous slide you talked about uh, projects that may be coming in from somewhere else, legacy projects. 
Uh, and then, so if they have a, a different license, is there anything that would? Yeah, can, there can be a lot of uh, work to uh, make that happen. You have to go ahead and get explicit permission from uh, copyright holders. So even for um, our work in standards, we don't get all of the rights to allow downstream modifications and redistribution um, of works. We get the rights for those who are contributing to standards to redistribute modified versions, but not past that permission onto others. So we have to make sure we go back if we have old uh, code and explicitly get permission from the contributors, uh, original contributors or entities, whether it was individuals or entities. Uh, what if is? Uh, I mean, copyright doesn't stop. It gets passed on. So you can go ahead and uh, seek those who would have legal claim to, the, to it. Um, and then there's always a risk assessment. You can decide if say that contribution is very small and it overwhelmingly is part of another one, decide whether or not you know, they have a strong enough claim and there's enough risk that you know, they, would, they would come at you and sue you for violating their copyright. Um, right now, we haven't had to run into those kinds of super difficult questions. For the most part, we've, uh, for, for instance, VHDL is one of our pilot projects, uh, 10, uh, IEEE 1076. And I was able to go through and um, uh, track down all of the old contributors and get them to sign CLAs, uh, companies and individuals, uh, and uh, work out difficult licensing problems like some code that was taken from 1992 BSD, which had a four clause BSD license, and you know figure out that that's where it came from because it didn't say, and <laughs> show why we can make the license change to have it be three clause. And it's way more kind of tedious work than any of you would probably enjoy doing, but uh, I did it for almost a decade with the Free Software Foundation, um, and so I'm pretty good at it. Um, In other words, you're lucky that that was a BSD, that, that was BSD code originally, because otherwise you could have entered into a more restrictive license space because of it? Yep. Yep, I was able to get it to become a BSD three clause license, and um, even though we didn't hold copyright and we didn't get a CLA, it was a certainly compatible BSD three clause with BSD three clause. Um, so far, we've been lucky. Uh, for the most part, it's new projects, new code that's being written uh, by working group members, so that's much easier. <laughs> uh, I have no doubt that there'll be some more complicated things, and there's. Some projects that I think are hesitant to become pilots because they don't necessarily feel confident in tracking down the provenance uh, information, who, who, where, what, when. And uh, I'm the only open source community manager, um, one of the only individuals who has real software development experience, um, uh, and certainly the only individual who has, you know, uh, real serious experience doing great open source software work. Uh, within the Standards Association, and so far I haven't really been able to find anybody who's a staff member of IEEE at large. We certainly have many members and many volunteers who have uh, a lot of experience in this space, but um, uh, staff is sort of you know a little different. Um, so our current pilots, uh, like I said, uh, I discussed the VHDL. Um, 1076, they developed the language reference manual. Um, so they're currently working on the next version of EHDL. They're one of our open source pilots. Um, the language reference manual itself is not going to be open sourced, but all of the libraries and uh, supporting code will be um, released uh, as open source. Um, it's not let, yet made a public um, uh, repo on GitLab. Uh, it will. I'm still working with them on um, kind of gutting out some parts that, proprietary parts, but they're separate works. They aren't necessarily anything that um, they should even logically be including in their open source project anyways. Um, more or less because a lot of this work was done just for them to uh, work things out internally, right? Or um, in terms of the code, it was just pasted into the PDF file. So our only way of hosting it previously was 
inline in a PDF. Um, uh, this uh, 21451, uh, this is a um, Internet of Things project, uh, and it's actually Internet of Things project um, in terms of the target devices. Uh, and uh, what they're doing is they're for uh, authentication, identification, and security. They're uh, creating an extension to XMPP, uh, the Extensible um, Messaging and Presence Protocol. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it as Jabber uh, for sort of instant messaging. But it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty large uh, spec um, and standard. XM, there's a, there is an XMPP foundation, uh, standards foundation. Um, this work actually started in the IEEE, at some point went over to the XMPP standards foundation, and then came back to us. <laughs> um, a little bit of a political mess there, uh, and making sure that was all okay and above board, and I'm uh, pretty sure it is. I'm sorry, which standards organization went to? XMPP Standards Foundation. Okay. They just develop uh, the XMPP standard and uh, extensions to it, official extensions. There's unofficial extensions. That's what this would be. Um, uh, there's, uh, here's a funny one, this P370, electrical characterization of printed circuit board and related interconnects at frequencies up to 50 gigahertz. <laughs> right, these are standards, right? So they're very specific in terms of what their scope and aim is to provide uh, for. And, uh, you know, so these, these, uh, these two, first two that I listed, you know, the VHDL stuff, people are going to uh, take that. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a hardware description language. You go ahead and you write, um, you can write out uh, code, something that is going to define the way a printed circuit board should be printed. So you feed it into a, uh, a circuit board printer and um, it's able to go ahead and produce your million transistors for you. You don't write those out by hand anymore. Uh, you need a way to generate those and to uh, figure out the logical arrangement of them and, and sort of uh, do some of that work for you. So it's more or less uh, similar to just compiling code and, and getting the output uh, of your printed circuit board is like producing a binary file um, in, that, in that same way. Um, you define it at a more abstract level, functionally and, and uh, modularly. Um, so that's what VHDL does. Um, you know, the code will be taken by people who are going to write those compilers or write those libraries or simulators that take in VHDL and either simulate what a circuit board will do or will produce a, uh, the, the input file to a, a printer of, of printed circuit boards. Um, and so it's very practical open source that people will take and literally use into these software projects, right? Uh, downstream projects will. Uh, want to use. Uh, and, and same with this uh, XMPPI stuff, it, it has uh, interface uh, definitions, uh, XML uh, uh, code that will be uh, just dropped in to uh, software projects that are going to go ahead and implement that on devices. Yeah? Yeah, Mark, um, what's the V for in VHDL? Very. Uh, no, it's a... Uh, Verilog? Yeah, it's like another acronym. No, it's, it's, yeah, but it's Verilog, I don't know, Verilog's another. Hardware de definition language. Yeah, it's, uh, it's this, I forget. It's like another four-letter acronym, but so that it, stands so for another four words. It's just to identify this, this particular. This is a particular language. Yeah. The so HDL is a programming HDL language. Among the H of various other HDLs. Right, it's a very specific language. Okay, thanks. Uh, like you would say C language or Perl. VHDL is its own language. Um, so, P through, so uh, you know, that's the nature of those kinds of uh, pilots. And then we look at something like P370. They didn't know they were going to have any software when they started. A few years in, they realized that it was going to be super helpful to basically uh, have uh, these, this, this testing code that takes in um, information that's spit out by, um, uh, uh, that when you go ahead and you connect to a board, here's sort of this 
messy things that can spit out kind of noise, other things um, uh, in the interconnect. There's all sorts of things you do to test it that aren't just um, testing the whether it's working or not. Um, and they, they realized that they only had sort of these big, expensive proprietary programs to do that work. And so they uh, rewrote it from scratch. They're all industry experts. They have experience doing this stuff. They wrote um, you know, all these scripts to do this testing. And they're like, well, this seems useful. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a disaster. It's undocumented, directory full of scripts. They're, you know, we had a lot of work to make it make any sense to anybody. Uh, but <laughs> there's been overwhelming excitement and support from industry. You know, they're, they're, they're so excited. People that actually have to use these things uh, have just gotten just feedback every week from people excited that they now have it from, from people that are out there uh, using and making these things that, you know, either can't afford or, or, or want to have a little bit more control over big changes to this, this software that they're spending a lot of money on otherwise. What's now they have something in house that's open source that they could use and adopt. What's the 50 gigahertz magic number? That, what kind of equipment below that are they targeting? I'm not sure. Yeah. It's really hard for me to learn everything yeah. so far. Um, they come in, and I have to spend so much time teaching that it's hard to spend a sufficient well, amount of time learning. PCIe interconnects um, go at really high frequencies, like 50 gigahertz, or, or potentially can. Um, and so as they ramp up board interconnects, like PCIe, and like um, some of the video, some of the video system interconnects. Um, it becomes really important because otherwise you get, mm, if you're not careful about what frequency you transmit at, you get harmonics in the board that interfere with your processor, or vice versa. Processor harmonics can interfere with your transmission across the board. Read Kels. Thank you. Like it in 20 years. I would summarize that, but I couldn't really follow. Um, <laughs> but it seemed useful internal knowledge. Summarize it for the bike. Um, so we have some other projects that are just starting. Uh, this architectural framework for real-time on-site operations facilitation uh, roof uh, project for Internet of Things. Um, uh, mobile health data. Um, this is from Open M Health, and, and that's actually something that's being used in, in the field today. Uh, and so that'll be a donation uh, into our open source. It'll be taking their stuff that they've been otherwise developing. And now they're forming a working group, and they're trying to get more consensus building from others so that theirs is sort of the standard as opposed to a competing standard. Um, or, you know, narrow the scope a little bit of the number of standards out there in this space for um, mobile uh, health apps. Um, and then outside of our standards working groups that are, you know, working to actually develop uh, official IEEE standards, we have a couple industry connections uh, projects, um, which I mentioned previously to you what that was. Uh, this one, this industry consortium on learning engineering. Uh, this one's kind of cool. I'm excited by it. Uh, there was, I think, like 700 people at the kickoff meeting uh, uh, late last year. And what learning engineering is, is um, if you're out there m making software uh, that's targeting um, uh, sort of, you know, online learning, uh, e-learning type uh, things, you have engineers coming into your, uh, uh, your, your development shop that don't understand uh, the, who that target audience is, uh, they don't understand necessarily how learning works, how education works, and so the purpose of this one is, is really to uh, start providing this path for getting engineers to learn how to make uh, sort of e-learning software and to, to lower that learning curve uh, and to get more people who want to specialize in this area of software development. So it's a really interesting industry connections. We don't know necessarily what to produce. Right now they have four or five work streams that they're breaking off and each of them is going to have repositories and some of them might be uh, you know, tools and software, interactive things. Uh, others might be uh, you know, just uh, learning guides. And then um, uh, we also have this new project uh, uh, primarily from government and, and industry in China that wants to use a blockchain for intellectual, intellectual property asset exchanges. So smart contracts to say, 
you know, you're going to license our trademark under these conditions and have the, the blockchain sort of um, capture that and to enforce it using smart contracts and things like that is, uh, you know, the best elevator pitch I could give for that. Um, they're still figuring out what they're going to do. And we have uh, several others sort of in the pipeline. So um, getting uh, these projects hosted, uh, getting their licensing worked out, um, and getting them going is, is, is more or less my job. So the big challenges we face uh, with our pilot projects and with um, uh, developing open source internally and everything else, um, you know, in, in the standards world, the product we've made traditionally are PDF documents. That's what we know how to make when it comes to standards, and um, we have very little in-house uh, very little in-house experience developing software. Um, and we have a, as I stated earlier on, a fairly complex governance structure. Uh, that could be somewhat slow moving for uh, making decisions around these things and, and cautious. But I would say for good reasons. Like I think everybody appreciates things not shifting too much underneath their feet when it comes to the world of standards. Um, having a nice, open, clear, transparent process for developing standards is what we've provided and will continue to provide. And making changes to that, we're cautious uh, for good reason. Opportunities, we have a huge membership, deep connections in industry. You know, pretty strong brand, strong name. Um, uh, we have resources, experienced staff, uh, and a lot of valuable experiences in-house that we can offer um, to people, whether it's ideas, directions, people who want to start new projects, where they should maybe prioritize things. We're, we have a lot of knowledge. Um, and then we're really good at uh, consensus building, facilitation, organizing events, uh, program and project management. And for me, this is one of the big ones where I've been involved in free and open source software for a long time, where I feel we can help. Um, so many of the kinds of problems I've experienced or seen experienced, uh, social issues, you know, choosing to just manage things over, uh, you know, a few different things. You have your mailing list, your IRC channel, blah, blah, blah. What could go wrong? Everything goes wrong, right? <laughs> Every time. <laughs> and you know, we're just getting to the point now after 30 years of free software work where we take serious things like codes of conduct and, and whatnot. Um, and you know, the standards world's the other way around. Its focus is how do we get really good at uh, having you know, professional collaboration? How do we steer clear of the common kinds of problems we encounter and everything else? And so, uh, this is where I'm hoping, uh, from my point of view, one of the ways, one of the big value adds that we could bring to the open source world is sort of translating it. Here's how we do things, whether it's standards or other activities, to uh, uh, providing infrastructure, tools, guidance, um, uh, or program, project, uh, and other kinds of management support to projects. Um, and, you know, I, in a sense, you'll see that in private industry fairly often, really healthy communities. Sort of community-run projects, you don't see it as often. We're going to be sitting somewhere in the middle. They'll use IEEE, and we'll provide resources. Um, if they have money backing them, then for some kinds of offerings we could do, we might have to charge. But our intent is to provide a baseline, which would cost nothing uh, for, um, any of the sort of qualifying projects. So, and that's the same for standards. It doesn't cost anything to make a standard at the IEEE. If you get sponsorship of a society, we'll go ahead and provide uh, the, the, the resources and support to the development of that standard. And so the same would be true for these open source projects and others. Um, uh, well, so thanks, P, Eddie. What? Eddie, questions? So the P and the number, is that for proposal? So P1276 yep. is. Those are active, standard. active. Yep, they're proposed. And then um, after it's a proposed standard, does it does it get? It means it's gotten a project authorization request uh, approved, and so they've gotten the approval of the IEEE to form a walk, working group and to develop a standard, um, and they have a timeline that they have to complete that within, um, and then they have to continue to follow the process, which involves. Uh, uh, review by a balloting group as well as public review 
in a process to uh, complete it within a time frame, you know, with extensions and other things possible. So we have a, a formal project authorization request and project uh, development process for standards. And that's whether it's renewing a standard after, uh, within a 10-year window is where you have for an active standard to begin the process of renewing it and submitting a new PAR, a new project authorization request, or a, um, or a brand new standard. Generally, brand new working groups come in as study groups. You form a study group and you figure out exactly what it is you want, what the scope is, and then you submit a PAR for your project authorization, authorization request to, to begin a standards working group. Um, just to give you details if you wanted them. So, um, so IEEE has you as an open source manager. Do you, do you sense the same sort of interest in the other standards organization, DSI or ISO? Yeah, I would say pretty much every major uh, standards development organization um, is uh, thinking about open source right now. Sort of the you know, 2017, 2018 buzzword out there is uh, open source and standards. And if you look at the other side of things, a lot of open source uh, uh, within industry has now added standards to their a group. So for instance, Red Hat, I believe, is now their uh, internal department is now named Open Source and Standards Department. So I would say it's, it's certainly the uh, focus of the world uh, of standards. So my interest in this is where this goes, like, like in the, the change, what would change the expectation from grid? So going from a, a primarily distribution of a centralized resource to being more of a, a sharing um, infrastructure and there's a lot of tension among the different parts of this structure as they try to upgrade it. So it seems to me this is going to be really important in anything they do with the grid going forward. I, I think so. Um, it's not clear, you know, how things will play out, but uh, certainly this is um, those types of sort of postulating and then trying to understand how this is going to affect things and how it's going to affect collaboration, you know, modification, everything, sharing. Uh, that's certainly on a lot of people's minds right now. Uh, you had a question? I, I, yeah, I did. Um, I was wondering, maybe you talked about it at the beginning. Um, Y'all do some Wi-Fi uh, standards. 802, yep. And just... Um, Way that we could start yeah. So the adoption and, and use of standards costs nothing. Yeah. We do charge for the PDF documents, but uh, you can go ahead and take those and yeah, implement a standard. Is it um, and that's more or less where our our role ends, right? Okay. When it comes to those things. Um, there are encryption groups inside of the, the 802 standard board though, for Wi-Fi. Sure. So yeah. There's sub there's certainly. So if it if it's a function in Wi-Fi. Right, but adoption of, of, of these technologies. So use of the standard to form a technology and then the use of that technology. You know, ours kind of stops at the standard. And then the development of something that implements the standard, some technology, that's outside of us. Okay. And then the use of that technology, which I think is where you are, I that's outside of them usually. You just describe to people who are like, why is Wi-Fi so crappy? They don't even understand the technology of it. And also linking to where they can start learning about how standards are, because a lot of the standards are not going to make sense to someone that's like doing community radio or something, right? Right. But to explain um, me, this is one of the policy areas, I guess. That's yeah, I think it's really important for people to understand some of these development pipelines, where they change, where they compete uh, on the technology side, the implementation side, the adoption side. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's fun to show. I think open source actually is a great opportunity for exposing more experimentation um, and letting people uh, do what could be considered pre-standards 
development. And once you have that going, how does that impact um, uh, you know, adopting these proposed or uh, experimental things um, that aren't yet standards? Uh, there's a lot of these open questions out there. Uh, one of the things we're working through is, you know, what does that look like? Yeah. How do we go ahead and publish things and make it clear this isn't the this is this isn't an adopt this isn't the standard? But here's all this activity that's happening, uh, and and these things that people would recommend using, right. especially say it's a security vulnerabilities found. Yeah, I guess you don't want to go ahead and wait <laughs> a year. Or more time to recommend I, a change. I guess the Wi-Fi is so one there's, of the ones that seems the most concrete to explaining as a real like thing to get to hook that what you just described. Yeah. And I guess a lot of people are looking at like in developing countries and the developing world, like this is actually a real issue is the problems of Wi Fi and these things. My time? Yeah. Yeah we're gonna I think we can start I triple E though basically describe what a screwdriver is. Yeah. And that's what a screwdriver is. This is what a slot yeah, screwdriver looks like. If you talk like. to the most media, community media activists, they yeah. wouldn't even understand what you, like, they don't even but, know that IEE exists. So people yeah, no, people have no idea. So this is the one.